Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the inner personality of the best hair. And damn, it took me a while to get to part three of this particular series. Today we'll be looking at The Horror Show, aka House 3. You remember the House Horror movies, right? I reviewed the first two way back in 2012. You know, season one. Now it's 2020 and I finally got my hands on The Horror Show. It's surprisingly difficult to find House 3. Now, the only reason I found it is because I purchased the four-movie pack of the Spanish Region Blu-rays. I mean, in all these years, that was the only time I ever found an option that was even remotely affordable. Anyway, what is this movie about? Much like the previous two house movies, it isn't so much a continuing storyline as much as a repeated theme. A haunted house! However, how has the house happened to be haunted in the horror show? Well, a police officer takes one of the most dangerous serial killers of all time off the streets, but then, after the man is executed, he comes back to haunt the officer and his family in his happy little suburban home. Thus, the officer has to fight his own psychological demons as well as supernatural ones if he intends to save his family. Also, interestingly enough, there just so happens to be three horror movies that came out around the same time of serial killers being put to the electric chair and then coming back to haunt people. I guess you could just roll this up with those into their own little cinematic universe, but anyway, let's take a look at House 3, a.k.a. The Horror Show, and maybe actually get some closure on this series. The movie opens up with the title screen, which really doesn't explain much, so we get a nice home movie next to the opening credits establishing, yes, this is indeed a family unit. And we move on to the beginning of our tale. On a dark and windy night, Lewis McCarthy, played by Lance Henriksen, is restless and gets out of the bed his wife is in, Donna, played by Rita Taggart. He's checking his house to make sure everything is okay, which is also a means to introduce more of his family, like his son, Scott, the 80s teen stereotype, played by Aaron Eisenberg. But what's this? Before he can even get to his daughter or the cat, there is a weird noise somewhere in the house. What could it be? Probably the cat. So better grab the gun and slowly sneak around the house, ready to blow away anything that moves! Problem with that plan, of course, is that it's hard to see anything move when the lights don't turn on. No bother. God damn it, Cosmo. <laughs> damn, that cat not only looks like my fiancé's cat, Dobby, it kinda acts like him, too! Somehow this doesn't satisfy Lucas, though, who decides he must check further in his house for whatever that weird noise might have been, heading all the way down into the basement. Ah, no bother, it's just fire exploding out of the furnace in an incredibly dangerous fashion. At least it's not the fucking cat again. But this isn't just any fire, these are the flames of flashback, pulling the movie into an earlier time where Detective McCarthy and his partner, Casey, played by Terry Alexander, are going to arrest a serial killer and meet up with two more cops, who are nowhere to be found, so Casey is more than a little shaken. Don't worry, Lucas has a plan. All right, I'll put 15 rounds for the prick. He eats and shits, same as us, right? Hey, he's just a man, nothing supernatural about the guy who is the main antagonist of this haunted house movie. Casey still seems extremely out of his element here, but when they split up immediately and Lucas enters, we get a hint as to why. Sweet hell, the man didn't even have a wood chipper, but he made do with a goddamn meat grinder. Also, I'm not sure if he eats the same as these guys, considering the serial killer in question uses a cleaver as his weapon of choice, and Lucas heads in through the kitchen, discovering all sorts of gory grub, repulsive refreshments, and dark delicacies. Casey! Hodges and Osborne are dead. Watch yourself. Casey, God. Casey! God damn, he didn't even get a chance to say he's only one week away from retirement. But hey, maybe there's a chance he's still alive. Ah! Yeah. Ah! Right, right, yeah. At least a few more seconds. It's that evil bastard Jenky that chopped his arms off, and he's still got the little girl. So with Casey's death, Lucas heads forth to face Max Jenky, played by Brian James. As he has the hostage and Lucas can just shoot him in the face at this distance no problem, he doesn't and instead complies when the killer demands he drops his weapon. Which means... Hey! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and, and the uh, now decapitated little girl was played by Michelle Dillon, in case you were wondering. <laughs> uh, 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 
having a nightmare. But it was all just a dream! Which is kind of obvious when you consider the only other option was time travel. I thought you were... Dead? <laughs> which I guess isn't off the table. <laughs> You're dreaming! Uh, no, but it was all just a dream, okay. However, this dream seems to have lingering effects, such as the cut that has mysteriously appeared on Lucas's chest. Ah, well, don't have time to worry about that now. It's execution day! I don't understand why you want to see Jinky die. I want to see it. Just want to attend the execution so I can watch that son of a bitch die. <laughs> Maybe say in the body count rises. And if you think that's asking too much, don't worry. Canonically, there have been some pretty strange demands in this story already. Max Jinky, whose one last request was to be buried with his meat cleaver. The same meat cleaver he used to kill most of his victims. You know, just in case he jasons his ass out of the grave, it'll save him a trip to the restaurant supply store. Detective McCarthy is known as the officer who finally arrested Jenky, But that's not the important thing right now. After reaching the execution chamber, with no wall or window... It's probably going to smell pretty bad post-electrocution. Uh, Lucas spies that Tom Bray is one of the attendees, playing Peter Campbell. We can tell he's important, but still, not quite yet. This is Jenky's show, after all. Any last words, Jenky? Blow it out your ass, pinhead. Uh, it's not really the most imaginative. Uh, Jenky came off a little more unhinged with, you know, the, uh, the decapitating a little girl trick. Your worst fucking nightmare. No, 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 you already had your last words, that's cheating. Ah, oh, well, on with the execution. They flip the switch and fry his ass. <clears throat> All that did was give me a hard on. <clears throat> okay, how long until we get past aroused and finally reach horrifying, painful death? Sometime, as Jinky just refuses to die, no matter how much they crank the voltage. If anything, this is only making him stronger. Is this all just a dream? Because, I mean, are you going to stand up and scream and shoot him six times and then we snap out of it and everyone's just looking at you like, what the fuck, man? Guess not, as this continues uninterrupted and even gets some more last words. Coming back to fuck you up. And eggs, too. I was supposed to pick up eggs on the way home from the murders. Okay. Ugh. And yeah, everyone else did in fact see that, but aren't nearly as shocked as Lucas about it. Yes, this is more common than you think, and the executioner is just desensitized or something. Well, they say he's dead, and that's good enough for McCarthy, and his still bleeding chest. Peter, though, is not quite so satisfied yet, and requests to check the body, just to be sure. The doctor, played by Stephen A. Henry, doesn't find any harm in letting him wave his little pseudo-scientific tools around, but isn't about to waste his time actually watching to see if the dead guy does anything, and leaves the scene. Just in time for an indoor wind to blow, the tools to begin shaking, and the little handheld gizmo to beep that something is indeed going on. Now where to, Castle Grayskull? Or maybe take out those meddling kids with Mystery Incorporated before they ruin everything. Or McCarthy's furnace, which I guess means it wasn't haunted earlier. I guess that's one good way to remain undetected, only haunt things that are already fucked up. Before we get much further, though, I should probably mention that Lucas has a daughter as well, Bonnie, played by Dee Dee Pfeiffer. She's trying to call up her boyfriend, but has to deal with her restrictive parents. I don't want anyone over here tonight when we're out. I'm gonna be 18 on Saturday. <laughs> well, tonight, that's still 20 to life. Thus, Mama says no boyfriend's over, and Bonnie? Ah, she pretty well plans to bring him over anyway, but pretends like she isn't. More importantly, they can't seem to find the cat. Heading into the basement, all Donna manages to find is jump scare after jump scare. But this doesn't really lead to anything, so let's move on to some lore and world building. Dr. Tower, played by Matt Clark, is a police psychiatrist who Lucas needs to convince to allow him to go back on patrol. Things look promising, but there's that issue of the mysterious chest wound and recurring nightmares. Tower has a theory, though. Stigmata! Irish cop last year shot a young boy started bleeding from the palms of his hands. 
Very strange phenomenon. So you see, unexplainable phenomena bordering on the supernatural do in fact exist in reality. Therefore, a psychotic electric ghost haunting your furnace is totally within the realm of possibility. Ah oh, well, profuse bleeding for no apparent reason or not, Lucas is good enough to go back on the beat. In the meantime, Donna is wondering why exactly their son has a massive shipment of quick that he's stashing away in his room. Because I wrote and told them I found rat hair in my last carton of the otherwise delicious product. Scott, it's the fourth delivery this month. Fourth delivery? He's got three cases of six two-pound tins. You mean to tell me that he goes through like five pounds of Nestle quick powder a day? It's not that serious. I mean, what's the problem here? Well, the rampant fraud or the absolute hell you're putting your internal organs through. Take your pick. Back with Lucas, Campbell tries to tell him about the problem with the big electric ghost demon that came out of the body in the morgue, but the cop doesn't want to hear it. Janky's dead, and that's the last stuff he needs to be fed if he wants to finally put this behind him. Besides, he's got a date with his wife tonight. So, Bonnie asks where, oh, where is her pink dress? Just, you know, not because she's having a guy over. She just really feels like wearing it for no reason. As it turns out, like most things in this house, it's in the creepy basement, with the lights that only work sometimes. Eh, the stage lights are good enough to find what she needs. <laughs> Damn it, Vinny, you scared me! Jesus, Vinny, that's a little too fast for any of us to know what the hell was going on. How did you even know what to do? Is there a blooper reel of this scene somewhere, where he gets half a dozen takes of him jumping out and kissing the air and slamming his hand in her face? Vinny, played by David Oliver, wasn't supposed to be here yet, but he says he was overcome with desire. Either way, Bonnie's parents haven't left for dinner, so he's gonna have to wait in the basement until then. In the meantime, Lucas is still heading home, and having some more of those handy dandy flashbacks! You know the kind I mean, the ones that fill out a little more backstory than the flashbacks before. Seems after the little girl got decapitated, Jenky and McCarthy had a good old-fashioned knockdown drag out fight, but he's interrupted by other cops before he can finish the guy off. Now to swerve after almost running headlong into a truck! This is just the beginning. I'm still here. Sorry, Max, that's Lance Henriksen you're trying to taunt, and you can't possibly be as horrifying or never-ending as a man's alimony payments. Unlike Jenky's ghost, who leaves the car quickly enough that Lucas can return home to his wife and not bring up anything about that bloody chest or the haunting or even the freaky shit that happened during the execution, they have a dinner date. Vinny, on the other hand, still in the basement, starts hearing some strange calls. Bonnie's voice tells him that she's down here, watching him, and wants him to strip down naked for her. I love you, Vinny. Do it for me. I love you. Vinny, do it for me. Oh, God! Wait a minute, Max. You're trying to haunt Lucas and torment him and his family and drive him insane or whatever it is you're trying to do. And the first order of business you have is to kill his daughter's unwanted boyfriend. I'm sure he's going to be real bent out of shape about this. Maybe next you can kill his noisy neighbor or some telemarketers. And yes, this goes on long enough that we can assume that Vinny is very, very dead. Oh well, while Lucas and Donna finally get to have that nice romantic dinner tonight, Bunny gets the chance to head into the basement and look for her lover. Obviously, he doesn't respond when she calls. Hell, Jenky doesn't even seem all that interested in spooking her as a great load of nothing happens. God? Bonnie? <sighs> We're home. Jesus, I know drive throughs that take longer than that. The dinner went great, and the parents are ready to get down to some good old-fashioned middle-aged fucking. But a random call from Max Jenky, or make that wrong number, honey, and there'll be no nookie tonight. Bonnie's still trying her damnedest, though, even asking Scott to help her find Vinny, because he can't have just ditched her. Surely he's hiding somewhere in the house, and they just have to figure out which corner he's scurried off into. However, before long, Daddy is restless and heads down into the basement, where the haunted furnace starts talking back to him. Fact, she looks good enough to eat. You stay away from my daughter, you piece of shit! Sounds like Dad found Vinny. Only if Vinny exists in some quantum state of existence and non-existence. Nah, hell, we're dealing with electrical ghosts haunting a furnace, so why not? Strangely enough, standing there and waiting for him to come back up results in them being caught snooping around after bedtime. This gets Bonnie to fess up that, yeah, she invited Vinny over and I guess Daddy found him in the basement. Thing is, Lucas insists he wasn't talking to anybody. And despite the conflicting information, Bonnie is grounded anyway. Ah, it's not all bad saying in this house, they sure know how to eat. That's some turkey, Mom. What is it, Thanksgiving? No, I just thought I'd cook your father's favorite. 
Now, I was feeling inspired today and figured, hey, spend every single waking hour trying desperately to get this bird ready by dinner time. You know, just on a whim. Hell, I love me some turkey, but it's pretty obvious that this sudden revelation that Lucas is positively passionate about poultry is really just an excuse to get the bird on the table because it's far easier to make horrifying puppets around a roast turkey than a microwavable Salisbury steak. Don't look now, Cub. But your family's dead. <laughs> and the body count rises. Oh, they did. They were really huge. <laughs> Don't you remember? Just kidding. <laughs> And the, the, the body count lowers. This is kind of how things go for a bit. We get some spooky, spooky horror situations, and Lucas loses his shit, but effectively nothing happens. Like when the family is watching a comedian on TV, but Lucas is watching Max Jinky on the television! Which chops up the Bobby Collins jokes enough that I have no idea what the punchline is supposed to be, while Jinky goes for the classic I'm going to murder you and your family routine. <laughs> just say one out of five. Lucas's family aren't the only ones concerned with his behavior. He's worried he's going crazy as well. So, still trying to get closure, he heads to Max Jenkins' old apartment. Who would he just so happen to run into but Campbell? He's here too, and has a shocking revelation about exactly what the plot of this movie is. When I was at Columbia, I was working on a theory of pure evil as a form of electromagnetic energy and, and, and electricity of evil. So you see, this is not supernatural horror, but in fact, Science fiction. As long as you don't give a fuck about how accurate your science is. But you see, Jenky used this handy-dandy homemade electric chair to build his resistance to electric chair, and the voltage they ended up using didn't actually kill him, but allow him to ascend to a higher plane of existence where he has ghostly powers. Well, that's nice. Not to worry, if they zap him more, then he'll just come back to life again. And then it's simply a matter of blowing the motherfucker away. Hold on, Campbell. Have you considered that he may have also built a resistance to bullets? That plan's gonna have to wait, though. As we see back at the haunted house, Bonnie has received a call from Vinny. Yeah, he's dead as shit, but you know what? This is just Jenky trying to get to her as well. I left you a surprise in the basement. Vinny? Even if that were true, at some point you gotta figure. Your boyfriend breaking into your house hours early and then ghosting you and then not your dad, and then sneaking around and doing all kinds of stuff, trying to fuck with you. I mean, if he weren't dead, you'd probably kill him. That surprise in the basement, though? It's Vinny's mangled corpse. Seems that's all Janky is tormenting Bonnie with for now, as this may in fact have been another means of getting at Lucas. I want to talk to her. For Christ's sake, you can't talk to her now. Why not? Let's talk about it on the way downtown, Luke. Because they think he did it. After all, he was screaming in the basement last night. And Vinny just called Bonnie up ten minutes ago. How do you explain that? What do we got here? Schrodinger's Vinny? Is he both alive and dead at the same time? So fuck logic in any way, shape, or form. Lucas is taken in for questioning. While this is going on, things slow down a lot. I mean, yeah, Campbell has a little run-in with Janky and is killed, but that's really all that happens there. Mostly we get to watch McCarthy get grilled by internal affairs, which doesn't lead anywhere and isn't important in the slightest. Not like this phone call his daughter gets. Who are you? What do you want? I'm gonna have you inside out, little girl. Which should probably clue her in that maybe it wasn't her father that killed Vinny, or hey, remember that time Vinny called you ten minutes before you found his body? That's a weird thing now, isn't it? Should probably look into that. So, what are you gonna do? Just take a shower like nothing ever happened. There's something about the threat of impending supernatural death that makes ladies in horror movies want to be all naked and vulnerable. Oh well, the shower completes fine, but afterwards... There's someone who is obviously not your father sneaking around your house doing horrifying shit. Maybe now would be a good time to clear your father's name. All right, what about Campbell? We just brought him in. Well, what did he say? In a body bag. Oh, shit. Okay, so are they going on the angle that Lucas killed Vinny, then left, and then called up his family pretending to be Vinny while at the same time murdering Campbell and then came back? Is this some kind of serial killer speedrun we're witnessing here? 
but he must get home. Fortunately, one quick punch in the face later, and that's all you need to just waltz out of the station. Before he can get home, though, Donna notices a strange little girl in their house and follows her down into the basement. He got the cat fixed for you, lady. God damn, Jenky's got an electromagnetic personality. So Jenky's got Donna. Right around the time Lucas finally makes it back home. Yes, it's that easy to escape police custody in this universe. Checking on his family, we learn that Scott has been killed. Don't ask me how, it happened entirely off screen. Alternatively, Bonnie is still alive, but in arguably worse condition. Oh, baby. Uh, uh, uh. I don't know how, I don't know why, I barely know what the fuck is even going on at this point. Because it's time for our unrelenting house of horrors! Lucas's wound starts acting up, so he goes to tell his kids of varying states of horror that he's gonna put an end to this. And after a decent shouting match with the furnace, finds himself pulled into Jakey's afterlife dimension place thing! It's like the opening flashback, but much cleaner. Also, now Campbell's here to remind us about how the final boss is weak to electric attacks. Bring him back. Blow the asshole away. And his head explodes. Don't know how, don't know why, it's just what happens at this point. The final showdown is about what you would expect. The horrors have pretty much ended, and it's more of a brawl between Lucas and Janky. Obviously, that's not going to be enough to take out Janky. Therefore, he gets her to help to fire up those handy-dandy generators that Janky just so happens to have kicking around on his beach. And once Lucas pins Janky to it, Donna can zap him good. Back the fuck off, bitch! <laughs> Donna, Donna, Donna! You just have to electrocute him back into the land of the living. You don't need to do it by shoving 20,000 volts up his urethra. It works, though, taking the shock schlong expressway back into the land of the living. Lucas gets the final word. Fuck you! Ah! The bullet! My one weakness! Lucas doesn't stop, either. He makes damn sure Jenky is 100% dead as shit. Therefore, happy ending! Lucas lived. Donna lived. Bonnie lived. Scott somehow lived. And continued defrauding companies out of cases and cases of food. And most importantly... The Kauai found. <laughs> Cosmo lived! Everyone lived! Except maybe Vinny and Campbell. I haven't really heard anything about that. He might still be chopped up in pieces in the basement, and... What about Lucas and the investigation? He's still the prime suspect, right? Are you just gonna explain that you traveled to another dimension and jammed a lightning rod in his crotch and everything's fine now? Okay. Well, that was House 3, The Horror Show. Could have been better. I will say I like the direction of this more than House 2. House 2 felt like a whimsical adventure aimed at very young audiences that just so happen to be in the horror genre. House 3, the horror show, is unquestionably a horror movie. The effects aren't the most sophisticated, but they certainly work, and the movie isn't afraid to get more than a little bloody. However, there's quite a few aspects that really don't work in this film's favor. For starters, while the horror is good, it is kind of sparse. We get the slow start, followed by some intense horror, and then it's back to slow. Like very slow. Now, the beginning of Act 3 is spent sitting in one room and talking about things that don't lead anywhere. Some parts of this movie are just boring to sit through, and that's really not something you want out of any movie. Also, I don't think I really need to say it, but the ending was underwhelming. Yay, happy ending, but it makes no damn sense. So the deaths didn't happen? Or didn't matter? Which part of electromagnetic evil causes time travel or a universal undo button? When the events of the story don't seem to matter, it's hard to feel like it made a difference even paying attention to them. At the end of the day, the horror show does a decent job of being a show of horror when it gets around to it, but it takes quite a while to do that, and the pseudoscientific woo that forms the backbone of the plot isn't nearly as bad as the body count rising and falling for no apparent reason, coming in at three massive tins of quick and a whole lot of Pepto-Bismol out of five. Yeah, it's ridiculous, and a lot of aspects really don't matter, but it's house. That's kind of its thing. Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow. And remember, be sure to look forward to the House 4 review in 2028.
still here. 